What inspired me to make this video today was one time in my sophomore class, we had a discussion question at the beginning of the class, do you think women should be drafted into the military? And I said no, because men and women are distinct and I think it would be more helpful for a woman to be taking care of the children at home as men fought to protect this country. And I remember everyone in the class yelling at me, literally screaming, and the teacher had to quiet them down. That is the response that I got for my opinion. As the world is taking a shift in how they view sex and gender, I think it is really important for people with a more traditional perspective like myself to be standing up and also not letting our views be criminalized and not letting this world lose the essence of what God created women and men to be. In this video, I'm gonna be contrasting the differences between traditional and progressive worldviews on this matter, and I'm gonna be making the case that a more traditional approach to sex and gender is not the culprit of inequality, but could actually promote equality. In recent history, many factors and events have contributed to a shifting worldview on sex, gender, and gender roles, such as the success in the first wave of the feminist movement, which allowed women to no longer have restrictions on what they could or couldn't do, and from that, women are no longer seen as second-class citizens. However, the third wave of the feminist movement has gone far beyond seeking equal opportunity for women, but it rather seeks to deconstruct and dissociate with the gender binary. We are now told that sex and gender is a spectrum that no longer involves a male-female binary. And scientists that have disproved or come against this worldview have sometimes even gotten their careers canceled. Though the sex spectrum model has originally intended to bring about acceptance and equality, it has really only led to a distortion of science and biology. When we seek to bring about change through misinformation, it usually ends up creating far much more harm than it does good. A large part of the population nowadays wants to see no distinct lines between the male and female identity and wants a more malleable definition of what it means to be a male or female. Many push to see men and women as inherently the same in all possible categories. However, is this going to solve society's problems or is this pushing the pendulum to another extreme? Voices throughout pop culture such as Demi Lovato are now claiming that even gender reveal parties are transphobic and should not be happening. There is now a trend of parents who are raising their child gender neutral, calling them babies. Jada and Will Smith, for example, dress their kids in gender neutral clothing and are self-proclaimed rebels against the very idea that there should be difference between clothes for men versus clothes for women. Another figure in pop culture, Harry Styles, posted a picture in a frilly ball gown dress um, with the caption, bring back manly men, in which many parents showed their support of this on Facebook by dressing their boys in dresses and having them pose for the camera. Some happily saw this as a protest against the gender binary, while others felt like we're, this is taking steps to a genderless society. Many people are seeing a push in culture to eliminate all aspects of the gender binary. While men who display more feminine characteristics and Practices such as Harry Styles are put into a spotlight of praise. More tr masculine men in the traditional sense are often becoming more under attack by society. It has become commonplace to see sayings such as men are trash, I hate men scattered through all of social media. Along that, there is a new internet vocabulary such as mansplaining or manterrupting. Even there has been some books published like I hate men by Pauline Harmange that advocate for the idea that men should be hated simply for being a man. Though violence should never be accepted, the term toxic masculinity is branching over far more things than just that. Such as Stephanie Papis on the APA website declared, traditional masculinity is on the whole harmful. However, Michael Gurian counters this statement by saying, like our academic institutions today in general, the APA pre presents these aspects of masculinity as our nation's largest male problem. In reality, however, if boys are able to survive and thrive in a complex world, they must work to be strong, resilient, empowered, able to perform, and at appropriate times stoic in the face of enemies and hardship, aggressive, assertive, motivated, and able to battle against bullies as well as help fight, fight our wars both abroad and at home powerful, successful in work, in life, in leadership, and when needed, in followership to leaders who are morally sound. 
These qualities are intertwined with tenderness, kindness, compassion, spiritual vitality, empathy, fortitude, character, and fatherhood. We are able to have compassion because we are strong. We are able to live from a position of kindness because we have the power to do so. Rather than advocating for healthy masculinity in society, even more mild masculine traits of men are being put down in the eyes of society as being toxic. It seems though as a culture we are painting masculine traits to be ugly rather than valuing men. The same traits that society is wanting to eliminate in men are the same ones that we elevate in women. Many women who are elevated and in the spotlight in society are those who perform masculinity, such as CEOs with robust careers, hardcore assassins in movies, and those who quote unquote break the glass ceiling, which is demonstrated by the film industry and in Hollywood. It seems as though women are far more likely to have the spotlight of fame if they are either performing masculine traits or being overtly sexual. As women warriors and heroines take the stage, those characters with a more traditionally feminine aura, such as the old Disney princesses, are now being scrutinized by society. It is sending a message to young women that you have to be either a super assertive career woman or overtly sexual to be valued in society. For example, the song Walk by Cardi B was named the song of the year and won numerous awards in the Grammys. About the WAP Grammy performance, CNN comments that they gloriously twerked and strutted and owned the stage in Barbarella-esque outfits, referencing female empowerment and delivering undoubtedly one of the most memorable Grammy performances of all time. The song that they performed, along with the music video, is highly sexual, or dare I say, pornographic. It features women acting sexual in front of the camera with a male gaze in the background, yet it is praised as female empowerment. Some feminists coin this as inspiring and empowering, while others coin this as objectifying, degrading, and harmful as a whole towards women. Not only does our culture promote the sexualization of women, it also seeks to undermine those who live a more feminine, traditional lifestyle. I have seen many comments on social media or YouTube or forums online that say having a more traditional feminine lifestyle is promoting misogynist idea and holding back the advancement of women. Even the term gender binary will bring such strong reactions and offense out of people it's almost a crime to even talk about. However, many believe that upholding the differences that are evident in men and women and how they relate to each other will lead to a stronger and healthier society. Because of the abuse and subservience of women in the past, many believe that any form of traditionalism is a culprit for inequality. The view that embracing masculine or feminine characteristic implies the inferiority or incapability of women is simply not accurate. In the 21st century, gender roles are seen as an embarrassing iniquity, but they're not that way for everybody. Some find living in light of it fulfilling. Many people still take on a complementary view on how women and men relate to each other. While some might find the notion of being protected for or provided by a man as vile, other women might find it lovely. While some find chivalry and gentlemanly favors as sexist, other women are cherishing it and are sad to see it downgraded in the public eye. Of course, there are varying levels of traditionalism with a bit of nuance to fit the current period. Some might find courtship or being a stay-at-home mother as an example of traditionalism, while others might find just simply letting a man lead a relationship as being traditionalism. However, women living their lives in a more traditional sense should not be a threat to the feminist movement. Women should not need to prove their worth in a career or in their assertiveness to be valued as a human being. A woman's worth is equal to a man's simply for being human. If a woman wants to value or prioritize um, a family, motherhood, or marriage, over a career, this should not be seen as a shameful thing. Another thing that should not be a threat to the feminist movement or to the idea of inequality is gender differences. On the contrary, it can uphold and promote equality. Acknowledging the differences between men and women can lead to equality and ignoring these differences can lead to much harm. Many acknowledge that men have the upper hand when it comes to physical or muscular activity. Males, on average, have 75% more muscle mass and 90% more strength than females, and that does not even take into account hormone differences. A male of average strength is stronger than 99% of women. These factors can make the playing field uneven and the disadvantage women have can be seen in many examples, such as the U.S. women's national soccer team losing to a soccer academy of boys under the age of 15. 
yet in today's society, since we live in the denial that men and women are biologically equal, we're now seeing biological men being allowed into women's sports. This has led to women having the rankings taken away in a range of sports and not being able to compete with their counterparts. In more extreme examples, this has led to many deadly injuries. In an MMA fight with Tamika Brintz, Fox broke her skull and made blood rush out of her head and stream down her eyes which was not the first time that biological females had their skulls broken while fighting Fox. Brent told Woe TV, I have fought a lot of women and have never felt the strength that I felt in a fight as I did that night. Laws allowing biological women to be allowed into women's prisons, restrooms, locker rooms can be a terrible setup for dangerous things to happen for those who take advantage of such laws. It can lead to the stripping of women's rights to feel safe in these spaces. For example, in the United Kingdom, where similar laws are already taking place, a male rapist was transferred to a woman's prison because he identified as a woman. Once he was there, he twice committed sexual assaults against the woman in the facility. This is only one example out of many. More occurrences like this will start to happen as laws are being put in place that deny biological differences between men and women. When we ignore the reality of sex-related implications, it can lead to disaster. One case that proved this was a John Jones study. In the, in the mid-1960s, psychologist John Money encouraged the gender reassignment of David Vermeer, who was born a biological male but suffered a failed circumcision as an infant. They decided to transition him with a gender reassignment surgery at birth and to raise him as a girl while they raised his brother, Brian, according to his biological sex, a boy. In his academic work, Money argued in favor of the increasingly mainstream idea that gender was a societal construct, available from an early age. He tried to use David, who was renamed Brenda, as proof of his study, and though his work was quoted frequently as a success, it was far from that. Brenda was miserable as a girl despite being raised as a girl since birth. Even starting at the age of two, Brenda angrily tore off her dresses. She refused to play with dolls and would beat up her brother and seize his toy cars and guns. In school, she was relentlessly teased for her masculine gait, tastes, and behaviors. Brenda would complain to her parents and teachers that she felt like a boy. The adults, on Dr. Money's strict order of secrecy, insisted she was only going through a phase. Meanwhile, Brenda's guilt-ridden mother attempted suicide. Her father lapsed into mute alcoholism. At 14 years old, the truth finally was revealed to Brenda, who renamed himself David and went through surgery to remove the breasts he had grown from taking estrogen. David went public with his story and would talk about it in interviews. Unable to get over the trauma of it all, David committed suicide in 2002. We do know this, that men and women are different and those differences have implications. And embracing this can lead to an abundance of good. Men and women's needs, preferences, and communication styles are often rooted in biology. And acknowledging this can often have great results in society, health, and relationships. Studies have shown that there are differences in the function and performance of men and women's brains. The BEM sex role inventory was a study conducted in 1974 which sought to characterize traits found mostly in women or traits found mostly in men. For example, men were found to have more traits such as taking lead, assertiveness, self-reliance, competitiveness, and willingness to take a stand. Women were found to have more traits such as cheerfulness, gentleness, sensitivity, shyness, tenderness, and yielding tendencies. Brain mapping technology has allowed a revolution in neuroscientific research. As a result, scientists have been able to record data about genetic, structural, chemical, hormonal, and processing brain differences found between men and women. An abundance of evidence has shown that men and women use different parts of the brain to handle the same task. Furthermore, the map of a neural circuit of an average female brain contains a larger number of connections between the left and the right hemispheres, contrasted with the male one, where the connection in regions between the back and the front of the brain is predominantly stronger. Luan Brizendine is one of the most well-known neuroscientists for researching the differences between the brains of men and women through the use of neuropsychology, cognitive neuroscience, child development, brain imaging, and psych neuroendocrinology. Her credentials include receiving her degree in neurobiology from Berkeley in 1976, attending Yale School of Medicine, and, and completing a residency in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She suggests from her research that there is more overlap between men and women's brains than there are differences. 
However, those differences matter. In her most popular book, The Female Brain, she claims that both sexes tend to have bigger regions of the brain in differing areas. Women tend to have 11% more neurons in brain areas for language and hearing than men, and the emotions and memory formation areas are bigger in women, whereas men have larger cores of the most primitive part of the brain, the amygdala, which registers fear and triggers muscular action and protective aggression. What's more, when faced with a loved one's emotional distress, a man's brain area for problem solving and fixing the, the situation will immediately spark. All of this is important because it allows us to expect and consider different reactions and different circumstances between men and women. When not viewing humans through the lens of these differences, we can make misguided assumptions and harmful judgments. An example of this is the commercial from Gillett that portrayed boys roughhousing as a trait of toxic masculinity. However, Michael Gurian states, roughhousing is a crucial tool in brain development for boys and is harmless and enjoyable activity. Recognizing these differences between men and women is even crucial for medicine, as doctors like Marie and Jay Legator are discovering more and more that gender-neutral approach to medicine could be harmful to both men and women. We need to take sex into account when there is a specific need or judgment. In John Gray's book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, which is Today, not a politically correct book. He writes that men and women often have different needs in relationships. They, unlike men, usually feel a need for protection and feel most complete when they are best guarded by a man. In addressing men's psychology, men typically want to feel needed, appreciated, and admired, while, while women strive to feel cherished, respected, and devoted. Learning about these differences can help boost the quality of one's relationship or marriage. Without the realization that we are supposed to be different from one another, men and women are often in odd relation. In my personal marriage, the books that have helped me the most are the ones that have addressed me in my specific role to being a woman to navigate conflicts, and that also helped me realize how men and women process information differently instead of getting mad at each other because you don't understand where each person is coming from. Both sexes need to encourage and support one another. Perhaps women who are subjected to higher levels of sexual abuse, instead of blaming men as a whole for this predicament, we can teach men to protect and defend women. It is time that men and women acknowledge that they need one another equally, and often a weakness in one is completed by the strength of the other and vice versa. A world that denies these evident differences in the gender binary is a world of confusion that lacks sense. Those most vulnerable to sex denialism is children. The dramatic rise in clinics of gender dysphoric adolescents, especially young girls, is likely due to this new cultural confusion. Reinforcing confusion among children to fight stereotypes is likely going to create damage in the long run. The birth of a genderless society would be the death of many beautiful things that pertain to manhood and womanhood. The complementary view of a man and woman's nature does not need to be put down, criminalized, or seen as a hindrance. It is something quite beautiful when understood properly and has the potential to produce a healthy social fabric of both strong and soft qualities. Men and women are complementary to each other. One fulfills what the other lacks and that difference is to be celebrated. Thank you so much for watching. I know this is a more controversial topic, but it's something that I feel very strongly about. One thing I do want to state before closing out this video is male and female traits are not something to be put in a box. For example, I am an IT major in college. My husband is, um, he just transitioned from geology to a graphic design major. Those aren't stereotypically male and female, but I don't believe masculinity or femininity is put in a box. Rather, it is just unique essence of characteristics inside of us that are to be lived out in our manhood or womanhood. And with all that said, I'm going to end this here because this is getting quite lengthy and thank you for watching this video.